Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, the U.S. has reached a deal that will allow ZTE to get back in business after paying a record fine and agreeing to management changes. We will discuss the next steps for trade talks between the U.S. and China. Plus, Amazon is attempting another home device breakthrough with its new Fire TV Cube. Will it woo more customers now that Alexa is on board? And Microsoft traveled to the coast of Scotland to set up a data center like you've never seen before. We will take you down under. But first to our top story, the Trump administration has reached a deal to get Chinese telecom maker ZTE back in business. The keys to this agreement, ZTE has to pay a record large fine totaling close to $2.3 billion. It also agrees to management changes, eliminating a key sticking point as the two countries try to avert a trade war. Now, the deal has caused a bipartisan backlash with Senators Warner and Rubio railing against it on the basis of national security. Earlier on Bloomberg, South Dakota Senator John Thune backed them up. Take a listen. Express concerns about companies like ZTE getting access to our technology, embedding that technology in our uh, telecommunications devices in this country, stealing our intellectual property and, and, uh, and, and using it in their country. Those are all things that I think uh, this company uh, historically uh, has been guilty of. And I think we have to approach it in a very measured way and a cautious way because uh, clearly China is, uh, has intentions on uh, surpassing and replacing the United States as the technological leader in the world. And we certainly shouldn't help them do it. Joining me now, Bloomberg Tech's Selena Wang. So, Selena, talk to us about the nuts and bolts of this ZTE deal. What do we know? This is absolutely a lifeline for the company. They're just going to have to pay a massive fine. They'll have to change their management, and they'll also have to allow U.S. compliance officers into the company to basically monitor what is going on. Uh, regardless of these changes, this is a huge win for ZTE. This is no longer going to cause the company to shut down. They'll be able to have access to critical key components that they need to make their telecoms gear, and it means that they're still going to be able to function. That being said, they may still have a lot of trouble and potentially lose, lose market share in both the telecom space as well as the smartphone space. Just a month ago, we reported that key clients were pulling out of deals. They may still continue to do so as a result of these management changes. They may still be spooked out by the long-term trajectory of this company. So let's take a listen to what other lawmakers have been saying on Capitol Hill. We have this tweet from Mark Warner. This idea of embedding a compliance team at ZTE is a nice talking point, but unless the Trump administration plans to open an FBI counter intel field office inside the company, Beijing is about to get one one heck of a deal on a back door into U.S. telecom networks. And this from Senator Marco Rubio, this quote unquote deal with ZTE may keep them from selling to Iran and North Korea. That's good, but it will do nothing to keep us safe from corporate and national security espionage. That's dangerous. Now Congress will need to act to keep America safe from China. I assure you with 100 percent confidence that ZTE is a much greater national security threat than steel from Argentina or Europe. Hashtag very bad deal. Rubio, he's been repeating the same line over and over again. And it is true that it is a nice and easy thing to say that you're going to put compliance officers into this company. But ZTE is a massive company, and it's unclear how much access these compliance officers will truly receive. There's still a lot of questions about whether or not this will be able to clamp down on the actual national security concerns. What this whole situation really shows is that the fear of lawmakers extends far beyond this singular company. It's a question of technological dominance. China wants to be technologically independent. They don't think that this situation with ZTE is going to change that and that they'll continue the IP theft and the forced licensing agreements and that this whole situation has done nothing to stop those greater issues. Are there questions about other companies and their relationships with uh, the Chinese government? 
Well, just this week, there's been a lot of discussion about the types of agreement that Facebook had with different Chinese phone manufacturers. And Facebook's argument was that what we did several years ago was industry practice. There were tons of U.S. companies striking deals with hardware makers so that they could get their own software experience on various phone devices. And now we are seeing that lawmakers are responding to what Facebook said. Now they're asking questions to Twitter, to Google, asking them what sorts of agreements did you have with these hardware companies? Was that data actually stored just locally on the phones or did it go back into the servers in China? So these deals are not new. They've been going on for many years, but we're seeing that lawmakers are really now just seriously scrutinizing these problems, even though these are not new issues. And we are hearing that lawmakers do want more CEOs to testify on, on Capitol Hill. Um, let's talk about the future trade talks and the, between the United States and China. We've got this statement from Senator Chuck Schumer saying President Trump should be aiming his fire at China, but instead he inexplicably aims it at allies like Canada, Mexico, and Europe. When it comes to China, despite his tough talk, the deal with CTE proves the president shoots just blanks. Um, <laughs> what does this mean for the trade talks that are happening right now a potential uh you know the, Ch the chinese government right now holds sway over a deal between qualcomm and nxp and more well i think we saw investors actually react pretty positively to nxp as a result of this they think that perhaps as a result of this positive deal for zte china will take fewer retaliatory measures so perhaps they will approve more deals like qualcomm and the nxp situation uh, but the bigger question as i mentioned earlier is that so far in these trade discussions, there hasn't been a lot of resolution about what is going to be the impact of the forced licensing agreements, of the IP theft that's been happening. And these are the broader questions that have yet to be addressed. And going back to the Facebook Twitter, Huawei issue, we are now seeing other Chinese companies get into the fray as well. In this letter that the lawmakers wrote to the companies, they also threw Tencent into the mix in partnerships with Xiaomi. So I think we still have a, a lot further to go in terms of what we'll see the result of this. All right, Bloomberg Tech, Selena Wang, thank you so much. Well, the Federal Communications Commission approved a plan to free up more high-frequency airwaves for next-generation networks and other services. The action sets rules on sharing and operating the 24 gigahertz band that will be auctioned to mobile carriers in November. Oath CEO Tim Armstrong spoke earlier on Bloomberg Television and said the move could be a breakthrough for consumers. The easiest way to think about 5G is 5G takes what historically you'd probably think about on a server or a device from an operating system and puts it on the network. So you're essentially going to have a network out in the world, wireless network um, and fixed wireless, that will allow you to do services you've never seen before to consumers. Coming up. After pulling Project Maven from Washington, Google is making its AI ethics clear. The company says its technology will not be used for harm. We will discuss next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. just released its very first ethical charter for AI applications. CEO Sundar Pichai called them concrete standards for the company's research and software tools. The company says it will not develop AI for weapons or technologies that cause overall harm or surveillance technology that violates international human rights. Joining me here in the studio are Bloomberg Tech reporter Mark Bergen, who covers Google. So what does this ethical charter say? What applications is Google saying they will and will not work? Yeah, this is a really broad reaching um, set of standards here, this charter that we've been expecting now for several weeks. Uh, it includes things like Google's going to look at the algorithms to make sure that they have minimal avoid bias, uh, whether it's racial, um, sexual, or political bias, um, to sort of this human-centered design. Um, they're also coming out and saying we're explicitly not going to build AI applications for weapons. Uh, however, they are sort of uh, 
you know, pointing the needle here, or threading the needle by saying we're going to continue to work with the government on a range of things from cybersecurity to what they call search, search and rescue. So they're not, they're not abandoning government and military work, uh, rather they're trying to set a set of standards that will appease their staff that have been really upset with, with their work with the Pentagon. Well, and is this a response to that staff revolt about Google working with the government? Yeah, absolutely. Place? So Google Cloud signed a deal in September, uh, part of Project Maven, which is a DOD effort to use AI with uh, drone footage. Uh, a lot of the Google staff didn't find out about the project until several months later. Uh, there was a petition that over 4,000 employees signed um, that, that said, you know, we're no longer, we, we want you to cancel this contract, and Google retreated from that and said it's not What is their concern? It. Uh, the concerns are pretty wide-ranging. I mean, I think the primary one um, has been there are people that, that, that don't, don't want to be working with the military. They don't want Google to be, quote-unquote, in the business of war. Um, there is some concern about the potential for the use of AI uh, in, in autonomous weapons, for basically building weapons that make the machines make their own decisions. That's sort of a, a concern that's years down the line, but that's certainly a concern that a lot of the AI uh, research community, even folks that work at Google and some of the Alphabet companies, ha have signed on to letters in the past saying, um, we we believe that AI should never be used in autonomous weapons. What military uses do we see with Google AI currently? Um, so right now, I mean, you know, they're they're looking to sell things as as. Um, simple as Gmail to the Department of Defense and the military. Um, and, and you know, Google has been talking a lot about their cloud services. Gmail includes AI, search includes AI, um, everything from their suite of apps to, to their basic uh, cloud storage has a lot of AI tools. Um, and, and that's why I think they really need to get ahead of this and, and put out this, this big principles. Uh, I think there's still a lot of wiggle room about how you define what is, what is a weapon system um, and, and how you define work that could be a surveillance system. This comes off the back of a pretty rough shareholders meeting where they um, rejected a proposal to tie executive pay to progress on diversity. You know, what do these new principles have to say about bias in algorithms and have to say about things like privacy, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think what they, they really reflect the, the fact that engineers and, and tech workers here are, are starting to take a, a bigger stand um, around things like ethical engineering. Uh, Google employees have been talking about this for a long time. What we saw yesterday at the shareholder meeting was really rare to have a current Google employee go up before executives and bring this proposal. Um, the shareholders re rejected it. Uh, yet what we're seeing with this Maven protest is, is there is a pretty large and vocal contingent of the company um, that's expressing concerns about um, AI used for military, about surveillance, about the effect of automation in the workplace, a lot of these issues that, that we've been talking about in Silicon Valley, and the, these conversations are growing louder inside these companies. What do these principles mean for other tech companies like Microsoft, like Amazon, that are also working on AI and also have a relationship with the government. Yeah, Satya Nadella, the CEO of, of Microsoft two years ago, put out something sort of similar uh, about AI. Um, I think this might, we, we've seen the ACLU uh, really criticize Amazon for some of its work with, with facial recognition technology. So there might be a bigger backlash. It's unclear if, if that's going to come from inside the company. So Google's sort of this, this rare company in many ways where they've always historically given, given um, their staff these vehicles for um, complaining, for protesting. And that hasn't quite happened yet at, at Amazon and Microsoft. And that was my next question. How do we expect employees to receive these new guidelines? Will this appease you know, some of the folks who were really upset? Yeah, it's, it's really going to be unclear. I mean, right now, some employees have been saying we don't want to do any military work at all. Uh, I think some are, are, you know, are willing to have these kind of conversations about there's nuance here where we can provide some tools to the military and government, um, but we're not comfortable with things like surveillance and uh, weapon systems. All right, Mark Bergen, who covers Alphabet for Bloomberg Technology. Thanks so much. Some stories we are watching. Indonesian ride-hailing service Gojek was offered at least a billion dollars of new funding from existing investors. These include Tencent, Warbur Pincus, to ensure its first international forays are successful. Gojek hasn't decided whether it wants the cash, but the funds could accelerate the ride-hailing firm's overseas expansion. Coming up, as the fight for the Pentagon's cloud heats up, Amazon Web Services announce a new, announces a new partnership that could help land it the top spot. We've got all the details next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.
Cloud computing companies are competing for the Pentagon's cloud. It is a planned winner-take-all award for a multi-billion dollar cloud computing contract, calling the effort to choose a single provider the best approach for rapidly delivering new capabilities to U.S. forces deployed worldwide. Right now, many companies are in disarray, saying this tactic for one winner puts Amazon in the lead. One company that could benefit from this hypothetical win is SAP NS2, the U.S.-based national security arm of SAP. Earlier this week, the company announced a new partnership with AWS, Amazon's on-demand cloud computing platform. Joining us now from Washington, we have Mark Testoni, SAP NS2 CEO. So, Mark, first of all, how does this partnership with AWS help you? Thanks for having me on this afternoon, Emily. Look, uh, ADB, we've been working with AWS for quite a while, uh, rendering cloud solutions in that government regulated space where there are usually more security requirements and they've been a leader inside the government space specifically providing the platform or the infrastructure we need to run. So we've collaborated rolling out SAP capabilities in human capital and also in some other ERP backend capabilities. So they. It's been a, a natural working affinity, and what, what's happened is we've built a good experience base with them. So we can go to a customer and, and bring an SAP capability and their infrastructure to the cloud for them relatively rapidly. So if AWS wins this contract with the Department of Defense, what does SAP bring to it? Well, you know, Emily, I think the, the DOD contract is an interesting uh, situation and, and it's certainly, as you mentioned, a lot of press around it. The reality is, is that there are many cloud initiatives currently going on in the department and we're working with the full panoply of providers, both the small, the, the, the people you would normally know, the Googles and the Azures, as well as many of the smaller players. Obviously, whoever wins this contract is going to get a portion of work and maybe some potential preference in some areas. But the reality is, is that the, the department is really looking to embrace, embrace commercial technologies more, more uh, across the board than it has historically, and cloud infrastructure is part of that. But at the end of the day, you have to put an application on top of the cloud to make it do something. And I suspect even though uh, there will be a winner potentially of this, and who knows, the, uh, the acquisition, as you may be aware, is, is, is still being debated a little bit, both in Congress, uh, with some oversight and down in the department as well, it may modify, but it, it, when it's all said and done, there will be multiple providers of the cloud in this space. Even the Deputy Secretary of Defense, who is one of the key proponents of this, recently mentioned that probably only 10 to 20 percent of the actual work would go to this, this contract provider. So I think it's, it's obvious to me that we're, we're going to be working with all the providers over time, and it's really important that we do so. And so then what do, you the make, what do you mm -hmm. make, Mark, then, of the concerns of rivals Oracle and Microsoft who say giving this particular contract to one vendor is unfair? I don't know if it's unfair uh, necessarily. I, I think we can debate that. It's not for me to debate whether it's unfair. It's the, it's the department's indicated direction right now. This contract, as I said, will only represent, in my estimation, a small part of what ultimately is the cloud infrastructure. The Department of Defense is probably the largest or among the largest conglomerates in the world when you look at them as a business, Emily. So it would be very difficult to, to specify one player, particularly when there are a number of initiatives going on already. I think the winner may have some natural advantages in some of the new work, but, but it, as, as if you look at the structure of the way the Department of Defense works, the military departments and their programs where the money comes are at much lower levels and they make a lot of these buying decisions. So I suspect there will be, you know, what really will come out of this as much as anything are standards more around how we integrate and interoperate across all the providers, one. And two, you know, how do we en enable and encourage more innovation and competition? To me, that's ultimately what needs to happen for the department. What are going to be the biggest challenges of moving the federal government and, and especially this part of the federal government to the cloud? Well, if you look at the government in general, it, it, it's, it's broken into pieces, but in the defense space, and in general, the cloud itself is an enabler, much like many technologies and many people that come onto your program you talked about. They enable something. It needs to be married to a specific need or use case on top of that. And, and how we not only bring that use case to the customer, but then how we can innovate even further from there. Obviously, the, the, the Department of Defense and the government has acquired capabilities for a long time in standard ways that date back decades. And we, they have to move, 
emerge and evolve with that, and I think they will. And part of this is is creating acquisition paths that make it easier for them to reach out and get it, and we're seeing that already. So I think what we'll, if you and I are talking in a couple of years, we'll have significant movement here. I can tell you right now that we're working with probably six to eight significant customers in the defense space working on initiatives right now. And so they are moving, and they're not waiting for a, the grand acquisition. They are really moving right now. So I think back in 2009, the, the CIO of the, of the federal government pronounced that we're going to look at cloud first. And I think we're beginning to realize that now. What are new security concerns that emerge with a Department of Defense that is in the cloud as opposed to on-premise? Well, when you look at, there's, there's always been this debate about security, but the cloud, what the cloud does bring is a set of standard capabilities around security and the ability to rapidly upgrade patches and new protecting capabilities that are much harder to do in distributed, distributed environments. I can speak from a personal experience. We often hear, if you go back to the last fall with the Equifax event, that uh, it, was, it was blamed on one patch not being applied. The reality is, is when you have hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of servers and devices connected, this is a much more complicated problem. The cloud allows us to do that more manually from a central location. So I think the cloud brings security improvement in general. There may be some perceived more weaknesses because we've now put a lot of things in one place, but the reality is it's a much more secure infrastructure. And as the department and other government agencies and some of the regulated industries move in this area like utilities, I think we're going to find we're going to have a more secure environment rather than a less secure one. All right. Mark Testoni, SAP NS2 CEO, thank you so much for Emily, joining Emily, thank you. Coming up, as the competition for your living room heats up between tech giants with home assistance, Amazon doubles down. We're going to bring you the latest Alexa incorporated product next. And later, we will discuss the recent investor momentum in the tech sector. Several big tech companies are hovering at all-time highs while also facing data scandals and increasing regulatory risk. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Amazon has unveiled its newest piece of hardware featuring Alexa. Q, the Amazon Fire TV Cube, a hybrid of the Echo and the Fire Stick. It can power your home entertainment system, play or pause the show you are watching, and still offers the basic Alexa features like answering questions. Announcing this new product only proves that Amazon is truly doubling down to dominate your living room. Joining us now with more, Sandeep Gupta, Amazon Vice President of Product Development in New York. Sandeep, thank you so much for joining us. So hey, you've combined the Fire Stick with the Echo in a square design. Why? Well, I mean, it's more than uh, combining the products. I mean, what we what we look to do is simplify uh, the home entertainment experience for all our customers. You know, they have a lot of choices, ways to watch TV. There's cable boxes, your TV, your soundbar. It's a complex world to get the shows you want to watch. And what we wanted to create was a product that could manage all of that in a simple device that's easy to use. And that's really what the Fire TV Cube is. So how much 
do you think incorporating Alexa here will improve Fire TV sales? Um, I don't know about Fire TV sales, but I think what it does, it provides a richer experience for our customers. I mean, one of the things that we've really found with voice across our products, it's a much more natural way to interact with the world, and especially with entertainment, to find shows, to switch to channels. Um, it's just the right way to do things. So where do you think in the future people will use the Alexa platform most? Will it be in the kitchen or the living room? Um, I, I can see it in both places. I, I mean, I think it's natural in the living room, you know, to be able to control your TV, to turn it on when you come home, to say turn on the TV, turns on the TV, you know, does the soundbar get you the right input? It's a very convenient place. And, and the ho in the home, the family room, the TV room is still where people come together, they watch shows together, they communicate together, and it's a, it's a natural place to have this sort of interaction for our customers. I'm curious about the future of voice activated shopping. When you're in the kitchen, you notice the things you're running out of. When you're in the living room, you can see products on the screen and, and make perhaps more informed decisions. What are you learning about voice activated shopping as you go? Um, well, it's still early days. I don't really think I can say much right now. I mean, I think, you know, again, products like this, we're, we're just starting to get these out into the world. Um, we're excited to learn um, what customers are doing, how they want to use them, how they want to use it to improve their lives and make it easier. And that's really over the next several months, years, as we do more with um, products like this that are very focused on entertainment in the living room and see how customers use them. So, you know, competition for the living room continues to heat up and, you know, we, we've talked about how, how Google Home is number two to Echo and, you know, making great progress. You know, what's to keep another tech company like a Google from owning this space? Um, well, I think, you know, listen, in the end of the day, it's what the customer wants, what the customer likes, what resonates with the customer. I mean, Amazon, our five TV products have continued to lead in the marketplace, and that's really because they resonate with our customers. They like what we're doing. They like the value we bring to our products. They like the experience we bring to our products. And that's why you know, products like the Echo Cube, you know, really do well with our customers, and they enjoy using them. And that's really what it's about. Um, it's about creating those great customer experiences that make a difference. And that's part of our philosophy at Amazon about being really customer obsessed really shines through. Meantime, Amazon is moving full speed ahead with new content deals, announcing the rights to stream 20 Premier League games exclusively. Will we see more deals like this? Um, I mean, I think we are continue to expand our content types, content sources. I mean, I think selection and options for customers is always great, having more ways to watch the shows you want to watch. I'm a big fan of Premier League. Um, I watch that every week, so having that available in more places is just a win-win for everyone. Somebody is watching Premier League in the mornings in my house every <laughs> weekend. So, um, you know, talk to us about what the incorporation of Alexa looks like in the future. I mean, I know that you are still learning, but what are, you know, what, how is what we're seeing paving the way for future applications? Well, I think, I think the Cube is a great example of learning from what we've done with products like Echo, Echo Show, bringing it to the TV space and solving that problem for customers in the home. I mean, we hear that all the time, like, you know, they love the Fire TV, they love the way it brings streaming content and over-the-air content, but they still have a hard Hard time managing their cable boxes, their TVs, and we really wanted this to fit into the world they already live in, and that's really what bringing Alexa to this to this uh, story is, is making their lives easier in the way they're already living and already dealing with complexity. And I think as we go more and more and do more things like that, you're going to see great products that continue to solve issues that people have in their daily lives. Voice search already exists on, you know, other TV set-top boxes. Apple TV has it. You know, what will set Amazon apart in this space specifically from the competitors out there? Well, I mean, it's a lot more than search, right? I think that's one aspect of it. Um, but today, the venues for finding content, searching for content are so broad. I mean, just like you said, there's the Premier League. You know, we have great content partners like Hulu and PlayStation View and Netflix. And it's really about not only searching, but also getting to those shows, getting to that content. So, for example, if I want to watch, you know, if I want to watch Bloomberg, I don't have to launch the app or try and find it. I just tell Alexa, watch Bloomberg. And that's really what sets it apart, is that ease of use, that ease of access, and that flexibility to do what the customer wants it to do. 
All right, now I'm sold. <laughs> Sandeep Gupta, Amazon Vice President of Product Development, thank you so much for thank joining us. Thank you very us. much, Emily. Coming up, taking a deep dive into data, why Microsoft thinks the future of data centers lies at the bottom of the ocean. Next, this is Bloomberg. Underwater data center. It is no longer the impossible fantasy of, well, Mission Impossible. It is now a reality thanks to Microsoft. This week, the tech giant deployed an underwater data center off the coast of Scotland. The initiative, dubbed Project Natick, features 12 racks and 864 servers, all housed in a large tank and lowered 117 feet to the sea floor. Microsoft claims that with more with more 50% of people, more than 50% of people worldwide living 120 miles off coastlines, this new wave of submersible tech could mean faster web load times and be friendlier to the environment. Here to tell us more, the program manager for Microsoft Special Projects Research, Ben Cutler. So Ben, first of all, what are the advantages of a data center underwater versus on land? So Emily, we see three potential advantages here, one of which is greater sustainability, uh, faster deployment of new data sensors to uh, serve our customers, and then uh, third, the ability to be more responsive to customers by being closer to them. So, you know, what would the benefits of an underwater data center be for me here off the coast of San Francisco? So, as you said, if you look at the world, more than half the population is close to the coast. So as we look toward the future and we have more interactive uh, applications, the ability to get quicker response back and forth to the data center should provide a better experience, for example, if you're playing a video game. Or on the commercial side, if you think about as we move the cloud closer to our customers, so for factories, uh, autom autonomous uh, driving vehicles, things like this, should provide a better responsiveness and uh, better capabilities. So talk a little bit about the pros. You have plenty of data centers above ground, right? So talk to us about the pros and cons of, you know, an, an on-the-ground data center like the one you have in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Project mm -hmm. Natick. So uh, when we think about Project Natick, uh, one of the things that we see is it's easier to cool things in the water. So over time, we've gradually reduced the amount of energy we use for cooling, but by actually putting it in the ocean, we can kind of drive that cost down almost to zero. Another thing that's really important is if you look around the world in the 21st century, we think that one of the uh, biggest resource constraints we have is water. And if you look at the cooling systems, whether of a building or of a data center, they actually use a lot of water to cool. And so the idea of putting something in the ocean that uses seawater rather than tap water or drinking water to cool may make it possible to take data centers many places we don't go today, particularly in the developing world. Where and when might we see this in mass production? Well, this is a research project right now, and so what we're really trying to do is understand, does this concept work? Uh, in particular, this idea that we're going to operate a data center where it's got no human contact for several years, uh, do the economics of that work out? And so if it does, then I think we may have a new tool that we have available to our product group to deploy in different places around the world. What about maintenance? It, it, it would seem pretty expensive to fix a piece of faulty hardware underwater. Uh, absolutely. And so the idea here is what we call fail in place, which is we over provision it. We have more servers than we think we'll need over the five years that we might leave it in the water. And so that even at the end of that five years, we can still do the full capabilities we want. Um, there's definitely a trade off here. But if you look at a lot of industries over time, we go to greater and greater automation. If you go back 100 years ago, for example, many phone calls were all connected manually, whereas today we have these small buildings. They just operate and no one goes in them. Uh, similarly, cars, if you think about when cars first came out, you had to get out of the car and by hand crank it to start the engine. Uh, they're much more automated than they used to. So this sort of thing helps reduce costs and bring greater value to our customers. 
Should we be concerned about the negative environmental impact here? And how is Microsoft addressing that? So I think that we do our research to really understand uh, what we're doing and whether it's safe before we go to commercialization. I think one of the things that people worry about here is you're putting this in the ocean, is it heating the ocean, is it going to hurt the fish? Uh, we look at this very carefully, not just theoretically, but actually do real measurements. Um, let me give you an analogy. Imagine you're standing on a bridge and you're slowly pouring a cup of warm water into a river. Uh, if we measure the temperature where it hits the river, it's going to be relatively warm, but it rapidly mixes as it goes down the river till pretty soon it, it's imperceptible. Well, the ocean is kind of similar. We have these large ocean currents. Uh, when we measure the temperature coming out of the data center, it's about one degree warmer than the water coming in, and then that rapidly mixes. The first phase one project that we did, a few feet or a few meters downstream from the vessel, the water is only a few thousandths of a degree warmer. So the effect is negligible. That's what we expect this time, but we'll be measuring it very carefully. Now, uh, we've heard this data center can store five million movies. What are you actually storing down there? So uh, this data center is for experimental purposes. Uh, it's used right now only internal to Microsoft, so there's no customer data there. Uh, so the early uh, experiments that we'll be doing are to really understand uh, is it behaving, performing the way we expect it to, and then later we'll basically uh, set it loose and anybody inside Microsoft who's got some workload they want to run, they can run it there. So, you know, this data center, is, you know, I know, I know it's just the beginning, but it's fairly small. Um, Right. less than a thousand servers where some data centers have 80,000 servers. Can this really scale and make a dent in the world's, uh, you know, the storage that is needed in today's world? So when we set about this project, really we're very focused on the economic aspects of this. And so the particular size we chose here, which is physically about four times larger than the first we did, is about the size of a shipping container. And so we can ship it by truck or rail or ship uh, using sort of the typical logistic capabilities that are out there today. So for a larger data center, you would have some multiple of these on the seabed. And so it's very scalable that way up to potentially very large data centers. All right, Ben Cutler, Microsoft Research, thank you so much for joining us. Fascinating. Thank you. Well, Airbnb has frozen a major portion of its home listings and guest reservations in Japan at the behest of local regulators. The company said it would compensate travelers who find themselves stranded at the height of summer tourist season. The startup had warned hosts it would delist those that it hadn't registered with local agencies for licenses as required by stringent new rules that take effect in Japan. June 15th. Coming up, Facebook has come under fire from top U.S. lawmakers with the clout to regulate the company after it revealed it had data sharing partnerships with four Chinese consumer device makers. But many investors remain optimistic about the company's prospects. We will discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Activist hedge fund Jana Partners has named Facebook one of its top long positions. This despite Facebook facing another data scandal after revelations it shared information with four Chinese firms. And it reflects a bigger theme in tech stocks, the best performing group in the S&P 500 this year, despite a strained relationship with the Trump administration and the growing threat of more regulation. Joining us now to discuss Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde in London and Dan Ives, Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Tech Research at GBH Insights in New York. So, Dan, I have to ask you first about this controversy, the latest one at Facebook that they shared information with Chinese device makers. And yet, as uh, you've talked about, the stock has recovered since pre-Cambridge Analytica. Will investors care about this latest hiccup? Yeah, I mean, look, if you look at the white knuckle period in March, early April, as Zuckerberg navigated the Beltway and then the Brussels over the last month, I mean, there was significant nervousness that you were going to see regulatory issues, major damage to the advertising franchise and users leaving by droves. Instead, we've seen it contained. I mean, we think maximum one to two billion of revenue is at risk this year advertising. We've seen minimal defections and they have navigated the Beltway in Brussels with flying colors. 
You look at this last Chinese news, this was not the news you wanted to see, but I think investors are a little more immune to this and trying to kind of see to make sure that it was on the phones and not the servers. And I think you see that the initial reaction, it looks like the bark's worse than the bite, at least so far what we see. We spoke with U.S. Congressman Greg Walden about this, who, who's very concerned. Take a listen to what he had to say. With each one of these revelations, it starts a whole nother cycle of what did you know and when did you know it and did you know it in time to have disclosed it but didn't. I mean, that's not good for Facebook and Facebook's a great American company. It's a great innovator. It's like these other companies are, but they've gotten to a place where they're under intense scrutiny now and uh, they got to get it right. And Caroline, now it sounds like the EU is planning to examine this as well. Yeah, they're keen to re-examine, so says one particular lawmaker who's actually in charge of enforcing Europe's privacy laws. Remember, they've just got a lot tougher. We've just had the so-called GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, brought in on May the 25th, which makes signing for and getting the user to agree to how you use the data and indeed perhaps even remove their data entirely, the right to be forgotten, as it's known. So Andrea, Andrea Jelenic has been saying they want to re-examine some of this particular data and the use of it and potentially being provided to handset makers. Also, we've heard from other German regulators, in particular a privacy regulator in Germany, saying this is absolutely alarming and this is exactly why GDPR has come into place to begin with. Uh, meantime, Dan, um, I want to take a look at a chart here in my GTV library. We're looking at tech market caps across the board and the momentum is just continuing. You know, we've been talking earlier in the year about whether there was a bubble that was about to burst. It certainly doesn't look like it. Uh, will these companies sustain these market caps? And if not, why not? Yeah, we still think we're in the sixth inning of this playing out. You know, ultimately, I think Apple hitting a trillion dollar mark cap, likely in our opinion, over the next four to six weeks, I think it's a seminal period. But I think you take a step back, you look at the multiples, you look at the fundamental stories in cloud, you see it in Microsoft, e commerce, streaming across Amazon, Netflix, and other fang names, and you've seen the V shaped recovery in Facebook. I think what you're seeing is just a very healthy market for spending, both on consumer as well as on the enterprise. I think you see numbers come up another 10 to 15 percent, multiples come up. So I think until we get into early to mid 2019, we still view this as a green light to own these tech names and any of the macro exogenous issues we've seen over the last few months. That's the opportunity to own these names during any of these white knuckle periods that we've seen quote, over the last two, three months. Caroline, there are some headwinds coming potentially for Google with in indications that the EU is about to find Google as part of its big Android investigation. What can you tell us? Yeah, we could get a fine as soon as July. That's what the latest reporting is saying at the moment, Emily. And it could be significant <coughs> if they decide to base the fine off the, mo the advertising revenues from mobile devices so this is all to do with Android all to do with basically the fact that Google when you buy an Android phone with, with its Android operating system it all automatically has installed perhaps Gmail it's got Google Maps it's got Google search and they're saying that this is anti-competitive to other search engines so they could lay on a fine to do with that they could also revisit the 2.4 billion euro fine they imposed last year all surrounding the shopping experience that you get on Google and the fact that you unlikely to find competitors on it they're saying perhaps Google hasn't done enough to react to that yet and therefore we could see fines even in excess of three billion apparently being put their way once again because they feel that in by day by day you could be fining Google but the fact that they haven't managed to tackle head-on the fact that they're anti-competitive to do with shopping online Meantime, uh, Twitter is being added to the S&P 500. It's interesting if you take a look at the charts for Square and Twitter, which both uh, Jack Dorsey runs both of these companies, both of them up and to the right over the last year, despite headwinds. Um, I've got another chart here in the GTV library uh, showing the company's turnaround at Twitter specifically. Dan, what do you make of the fact that Dorsey has somehow been able to pull this off? Yeah, I mean, Dorsey's had the golden touch. I mean, if you look at the Twitter turnaround story, 
it's really been remarkable over the last 12 months. You know, on the monetization theme, what we've seen on user and just engagement, you know, Square, the success speaks for itself. You go back 12 to 18 months, there's a lot of the bears in the street that thought Square's business model was just not sustainable. So I think when you look what Dorsey's done here at Forest Through the Trees, I mean, it's one of the more remarkable leadership positions and, and really jobs that we've seen both companies in different ways had challenges. Square, obviously, growth, but just navigating some of the competition. And the Twitter turnaround story speaks for itself. I mean, what's happened there has just been a massive turnaround. And we continue to think Twitter goes higher here. But, I mean, Dorsey should be getting a ton of credit here with the golden touch on both names. And, and quickly, Caroline, this, this tech rally that we're seeing here in the U.S. isn't limited to the U.S. It's happening globally. Yeah, you're right. We're seeing stocks, in particularly in the technology sector, doing very well in Europe as well. They've been up in Asia. The chip makers in particular have been a source of growth. And I think what's notable is we're getting a lot of excitement about new companies coming to the public markets. We've just had today Net Company, that's one Danish company, IT Services, up 25% on the first day of trade. Next week, we've got the payment provider, Dutch one called Adyen, coming to the market. $8 billion valuation. We're seeing it going to list about a $1 billion worth of shares. That's yet another a notable sign that there is appetite for these sorts of tech companies. All eyes on the fintech, fintech company funding circle likely to come after the summer, of course, in the UK as well. All right. Caroline Hyde for us in London and Dan Ives with GBH Insights in New York. Thank you both. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology from San Francisco. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.